A title, Addressing Communication Barriers. Amy E. Judy, Senior Program Associate, Center on Victimization and Safety, Vera Institute of Justice. One of the first things I do uh, in working with, with deaf uh, victims or survivors, one of the, the key issues is determine, to determine how best they communicate. Um, so if you're working with someone who's deaf, what you would want to do is find out from them what is the means by which th that the two of you can have the most effective communication. Now, the Americans with Disabilities Act requires that victim service providers, victim advocates provide effective communication. But let's talk in practice. What does that mean? It means figuring out with that person. So if, if they're deaf, they might let you know through writing um, specifically that they need an American Sign Language interpreter. I would write back and say, you know, thank you, is there anyone in particular that, that you've worked with that you would like us to call? Or go ahead and call a number of different ASL interpreter organizations so that I can ensure and advocates can ensure that that dialogue between advocate and victim is effective. So that would be one thing. For someone who's hard of hearing, I would, I would ask some questions of that person. What is the most effective way for you and I to communicate with each other? Because I want to be sure as the advocate that, that what I'm hearing and what we're going to be talking about, I'm understanding everything that you're needing and wanting so that you can avail yourself of the services we have to offer. So for example, depending on the nature of the communication, how long it is, um, and how that person communicates and how complex the information is, I might ask them, you know, is there, is there an interpretation or translation service that would be helpful to you? Do you prefer that we write things back and forth? Would it be easier if maybe the two of us sit at the computer and we can, we can write back and forth uh, is that easiest? I will find out from that person what they need in order to make communication most effective. And a similar question as it relates to someone that may have a sight impairment or may be blind, what would you suggest as tips for advocates or service providers? Again, I think advocates are best served by finding out from that individual what they need, what will, what, what will make the communication work more smoothly and effectively for that person. So for example, often advocates will have uh, different forms and different handouts that they're wanting to use in communicating with, with a victim. Well, someone with low vision or someone who's blind uh, what's written on paper is not necessarily going to be useful for them. So, for example, if I have a, um, uh, an informed consent form that, that someone needs to sign for me to be able to provide certain types of services, as an advocate, what I would ask is, you know, here's the form, I'd explain what it is, uh, I'd have it available if that would be most useful in large print, 18, 20, 24 point font, whatever is needed if it's larger print. Um, would they prefer that I load that form onto the computer and we can have the screen reading software on the computer, you know, read through that form at that person's own pace to learn exactly what they're providing and form consent for. Some people who are blind use Braille. Um, so advocates would want to make sure that the materials that they use regularly, informed consent forms, safety planning documents, um, brochures about their organization and the services they provide to elder victims, you would want to make sure to have on hand some of those oft-used documents in alternative formats, large print, braille, and sometimes on videotape or on a little USB drive so that each person coming in, regardless of their particular issue related to vision, they have access to that information. Evelyn Lauriano, Executive Director, Neighborhood Self-Help by Older Persons Project, New York, New York. First and foremost, when you're working with an older adult, you need to be aware of the fact that you have to pace your interview 
with their ability to understand. So is there a language issue? Um, does the person under speak English? Is English the primary language? Um, are you using uh, a qualified translator or interpreter as opposed to a family member who may be the alleged abuser? Um, so that it's very important to involve, um, to make sure that the person understands the language. Use a language bank. Have qualified interpreters and translators. Don't rely on lay people. Um, don't call in the housekeeper that's in the hallway that happens to speak the language and have them come in. Um, try not to use neighbors. Definitely do not use children as translators. That's a sign of disrespect. Um, so uh, the, the resources may be hard to get, but we have uh, telephone language banks you can call in. Um, you, we need qualified translators when we're working with that. Logos appear. NCALL, www.ncall.us, Terranova Films, terranova.org. Funded by the U.S. Department of Justice, Office on Violence Against Women and Elder Justice Initiative, www.justice.gov slash elderjustice. A disclaimer, this project was supported by grant number 2014 AXTA K050, awarded by the Office on Violence Against Women and by the Elder Justice Initiative, U.S. Department of Justice. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this program are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Department of Justice, Office on Violence Against Women, or the Elder Justice Initiative.